can do anything. I can do all things, because it's you who gives me strength. Nothing is impossible through you. Blind eyes are open. Strongholds are broken. I'm living by faith. Nothing is impossible. Through you, blind eyes are open, strongholds are broken, I am living by faith, nothing is impossible. I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe in you, I believe, I believe. I believe, I believe in you. Through you, I can do anything. I can do all things, because it's you who gives me strength. Nothing is impossible through you. Blind eyes are open. Strongholds are broken. I'm living by faith. Nothing is impossible. I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe in you. I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe in you. When all that's within me feels dry This is my prayer in my hunger and need My God is the God who provides This is my prayer in the fire In weakness or trial or pain There is a faith proved of all worth and gold so refine me, Lord, through the flame. I will bring praise, I will bring praise. No weapon formed against me shall remain. I will rejoice, I will declare, God is my victory and he is here. This is my prayer in the battle When triumph is still on its way I am a conqueror and co-heir with Christ So firm on his promise I'll stand I will bring praise, I will bring praise No weapon formed against me shall remain I will rejoice I will declare, God is my victory, and He is here. All of my life, in every season, You are still God. I have a reason to sing. I have a reason to worship. All of my life, in every season you are still God I have a reason to sing 
I have a reason to worship. All of my life, in every season, you are still God. I have a reason to sing. I have a reason to worship. I will bring praise. I will bring praise. No weapon formed against me shall remain. I will rejoice. I will declare God is my victory and he is here. I will bring praise. I will bring praise. No weapon formed against me shall remain. I will rejoice. I will declare God is my victory and he is here. This is my prayer in the harvest, where favor and providence flow. I know I'm filled to be emptied again, the seed I receive I will sow. Amen. I want to invite you to be seated. For the opportunity to praise. Amen. Amen. I love it. You know, it's like, that's one of my favorite things about the Psalms is that you, you look into them and you see David doing that. And he talks about all his different circumstances. He talks about times when he was going through trials, when he's going through personal things, or he's made some wrong decisions in his life, when his enemies are surrounding him. And I mean, just everything that goes on. And ultimately you see each Psalm conclude with this image in which David remembers who God is. He remembers God's faithfulness. He remembers God's strength and that, that that is what anchors his life. And just praise God. I mean, it's like that we have that, that in every circumstance, we praise God for who he is and for how he strengthens us, how he gifts us each day. Let's spend a little time in prayer. Gracious Lord and God, it is so good to lift up prayers of praise to you. Lord, we do it in song. We do it in words. We do it... Lord, we do it all day long, and Lord, we just pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would lead us each day to just rise and praise you, rise and give praise to you that you have given us breath for the day, rise and give praise that you have given us the opportunity to go out into the world, to experience your goodness and your kindness, and to be that goodness and kindness in the lives of others. Lord, that you have given us a voice, you have given us talents and abilities, Lord, we have the ability to impact the life of another. And Lord, we just want to thank you for that, for all the opportunities that you place before us. Lord, we thank you that you saved us. We didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it. We didn't warrant it in any way. But mighty God, you came down in Jesus Christ. And you saved us. We live in the power of that salvation every day. We want to give you all the praise and honor and glory every day, every moment of our lives. Lord, as we come to worship, as we come to exalt you, we also come to feed on your word. That you may strengthen us and remind us. That you may witness to us and empower us to be your witnesses in the world. In your holy name, amen. Well, I came across something this week. It, it so captured me, and I tried to find a little more detail. I only know a name. Her name is Kendra Price. I cannot find out where she is from. Um, don't know the background. Don't know if she's a pastor, not a pastor. She probably sounds like one. Um, but it, it just captured me what she said, and, and I want to share it with you. It says, you cannot be whom God intended when you are not in the state that God created you to be. Somebody didn't get what I was saying there, so let me put it this way. When God wanted to create fish, he spoke to the sea. And when God wanted to create the trees, he spoke to the earth. But when God created us, he spoke to himself. He said, God said, let us make man in our own image. Let us make mankind in our own likeness. If you take the fish out of water, it dies. And if you remove the tree from the soil, it dies. Likewise, when a man is disconnected from God, he dies. 
God is our natural environment. We were created to live in his presence. And it's only in him that life exists. It is in him that we live, move, and have our being. Lord, please fill us. Chronic use forces the body to adapt, to compensate. When we are without the Holy Spirit, we have to adapt. We have to adapt to be a way that allows us to function in the world. And yes, adapt tends to have a positive connotation, but the word adapt really means to adjust to new conditions. We become comfortable in our sinful state. We get comfortable praying less and praising less. We get comfortable with being more selfish and more self-centered. We are without the Holy Spirit, but I can guarantee there is a spirit at work in our lives, and it isn't good. Her words so captured me. I listened to them over several times. I mean, just, just listening to that image of, you know, we, we know, we always talk about, you know, being like a fish out of water. We're out of our natural environment. We're out of that which sustains life. We think of the image of pulling a tree up, you know, up from its roots, up from the soil and expecting it to live on, and yet we know it won't. And, and yet as human beings, sometimes we do that with our lives where we say we disconnect from our source of life. We disconnect from that which we were designed to be connected to. And we still want this fruitful, wonderful, blessed life. We want everything to go right, even when we're disconnected from our power source. It took me back to Genesis 2, and this is going back to the image of the garden. It says, the Lord took the man and he put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And the Lord commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will die. You will certainly die. And over in Genesis 3, we see this is where things get fractured. It says, then the Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. And what gets captured in there is he talks about the garden in chapter two, and he talks about one tree that they can't eat from, right? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But in chapter 3, he starts making reference to this other tree. This, this tree of life that wasn't mentioned in chapter 2. There's only one tree that is off limits, which tells us that what was there present in chapter 2 is that the tree of life was there. That Adam and Eve were allowed to eat from the tree of life. That Adam and Eve were intended to be eternal with God. But then they crossed over that line, didn't they? They crossed over that line of sin and everything changed. And God said, okay, you have taken things into your own hands. You've decided to do it your way. You have decided to, to pursue things apart from me. And now you're going to lose access to that which gave you life. That image of you will most certainly die. Everybody wants to grab onto that and say, well, you know what the serpent said. You know, I mean, he, he lied to Eve. Well, did he? Did he really lie? Because if Eve was thinking on the mindset that, she was going to physically collapse into physical death. Was that God's plan? When Adam was, was confronted with the same thing, was the image that, that he was going to collapse into physical death, could they even see the idea that there would be spiritual death in which they would remove themselves from the source of life, remove that connection, and choose to go their own way by their own power and their own strength? And then we look at what unfolds in the rest of Genesis. As they get removed from the garden, cut off from God's direct presence, and things begin to go foul as they have two kids, Cain and Abel. And the first thing we see show up is murder. We jump only a little bit further down the road into chapter 6 of Genesis. And in verse 5, it says, The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. Can you imagine? Everything's created in perfection. Everything is given as this beautiful gift. We are made in the image of God. We're unwilling to accept what God offers. We, we think there's being something that's being held back. We choose our own way. We choose our own future. We choose our own strength. We choose our own desires. We cut ourselves off from that which gives us life. 
and then things go downhill mighty quick. Think about that for a second. Think about just in your own life. What would it be for you to have every thought in your head being evil all the time? Now I want you to multiply that by everyone in your household, your extended family, your friends, your neighbors, the stranger, the enemy. Consider how we would treat each other if our thoughts were only, only evil all the time. Because usually our actions follow our thoughts, don't we? And we look throughout the Old Testament and we see people did evil. They rebelled. They worshipped false gods. There was murder. There was rape, adultery, theft, lies, hate, bitterness, greed, lust, envy, covetousness. I mean, the list just keeps on going on and on and on. And what we see in the Old Testament is this image of God calling his people back. He raises up a servant and says, come back to me. Come back to me and obey. Come back and live in obedience and begin to, to find a little taste of what life was intended to be. But as soon as they got a good taste and things started to go well, they immediately turned back to their, own, their old ways, their own ways, really. They, they went back that same path where they began to pursue things and take hold of things by their own strength. And so we see this constant drawing together and falling away of God's people throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. And over the course of the last 2,000 years, we see that in, in every human life. That, that, that battle that started in the Garden of Eden, that battle where there was the great disconnect, that battle, battle where Adam and Eve said, we don't need that life source, we can make our own. And every time we choose a path of sin, that's what it's saying. It's saying, God, I, I know that you have created me to be like you, that I'm created in your image, that, that you first gave the law, but now you've given the Holy Spirit, poured your Holy Spirit into me, that I may live by the strength of the Spirit, and yet I still choose my way. Because I want to take hold of life according to my thinking. I want to take you to a powerful piece of scripture that the Apostle Paul, God used the Apostle Paul to write this to the Christians in Rome. We find it in chapter 8 of Romans. And it says, Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Paul, and, and I, I love the way that Paul writes. This is another one of those sections where Paul, he says it, and then he says it again, and then he kind of says he said it, and then he says it in a different way. He wants to make sure that we get this, that there are two things that are always at work in us. There are two spirits that are trying to vie for our attention, for our life. There is the Spirit of God, and we know the Spirit of God is all about making us righteous in God's sight, about restoring us in that relationship, about sealing that blood that Jesus poured out for us, that, that we would ultimately end up in eternity, but that we live that, that holy, that blessed, that... Did you hear those words in there where it talks about when we live by the Holy Spirit, that we will have peace? What is it to have peace with God? But, but, but when we live by the flesh, when we get drawn in by the flesh or by our, our human thinking or our worldly thinking or, or, or we get baited by Satan, 
We embrace death. We, it's like, and we know it, we've been warned of it. It is throughout this holy word. We have been warned about it over and over and over and over again that we are just walking in the footsteps where Adam and Eve walked. And that the Holy Spirit has come to lead us in a new way. To point us according to God's intent in the very beginning. Because the God's intent for us was never to be separated from our life, life source, but to always be connected that we could live the wonderful and fruitful life he intended. Genesis is not a book of God saying, you know, I'm a little bored, so let me put some people on this planet because I know they're going to screw up and I'm going to get to watch how bad they screw up. It's like, it doesn't say that. It says in Genesis, it says God gave the earth and all that is in it for our enjoyment, for our blessing, for our benefit. God desired to share this with us. And when we went astray, when we turned towards sin, whether you look at Adam and Eve, or you look at Cain and Abel, or you look throughout the Old or the New Testament, or you look into your own life today, God has never given up on anyone in the human race. God has continued to pursue with that great grace in which he has poured out, he has reached out. He showed his mercy throughout the Old Testament and showed his great grace through the New Testament. And if you look in the book of Revelation... I've had so much fun over the years when I've, when I've done Revelation as a Bible study, and people are like, oh, I'm scared of that book. I don't want to. It's, so, it's kind of freaky. And it's like, but you know what? If you're in Christ, it shouldn't be freaky. It shouldn't be scary. It should be a book of hope and promise, the culmination of our Savior returning. And on top of that, oh my gosh, but what about all those people that don't worship him? If you read in the book of Revelation, you see over and over and over and over and over again, God reaching out through those scriptures saying, just turn and worship me and I will receive you, accept me as your God and, and I, will, I will bring salvation into your heart. And the last time that offer is made, well into the book, the people go and hide in caves and then pray to the rocks, the dead rocks up on the top of the mountain to come rolling down and crush them to death rather than turn and acknowledge the Lord their God. The flesh is a beast. Sin is a beast that has robbed us of life. And Satan is the author. He is the one who sends deceptions and temptations into our life to draw us away from him who is life. He doesn't want us to be restored to what we were intended to live in. And that's all God wants for us. That's all God wants for us. But it means that when temptation comes our way, we have to turn. Not play around with it. Not toy with it. Not think that we can manage it. Not think that we can handle it. Not dip our toe in the water and say, oh, I'm sure I won't drown, it's just a toe. That's how we play with sin, isn't it? We, we get to that precipice and we think we can manage. He's the great deceiver, the father of lies. And we were warned about him over and over and over and over again in the Holy Word. If there are people who you think would be anchored in following Christ no matter what, don't you think it would be some of the apostles? I mean, at least the inner three, Peter, James, and John, right? But we find them with the same struggles, the same kind of battles that, that we battle with. They play with that line of temptation. They get drawn in by it. Sometimes they back over it because Satan is so cunning in his ways. All he wants to do is get his hooks into us and say, come on, just, just step back just a little bit. It's better over here. You'll have more fun. You'll be in control. You will have power. You'll be wealthy. You'll be whatever it is that will entice but he only brings death. It says in the Holy Word, Satan came to do nothing more and nothing less than to rob, steal, and destroy. That's his aim for our life. Jesus Christ came to bring life. And the words are life 
abundant. Do we even know what that word means? I mean, we know what the word means, right? But do we know it when God defines it? Do we know it when, when we take full hold of it and say, okay, God, when, every time your spirit speaks, I, I am, I'm striving to listen. When the Spirit warns me, when the Spirit draws me, when the Spirit teaches me, when the Spirit... I'm hungry to listen. I'm going to turn from temptation. But not by my strength. By His. We've got the living blood of the Lamb at work in us that's purified us. And we've got the Holy Spirit of God that seeks to continually purify us over and over and over and over again. The Christian word we use for that is to sanctify, to make set apart. There is an abundant life that God created us for all the way back in Genesis. And every day is working to bring to each and every one of us. His desire is that we would be wholly connected to our source of life. And that we would rediscover the life we were intended for. Now you may be on top of the world right now saying, yeah, I'm going to take hold of that. And I promise you, if that's where you're at right now, Satan just picked up his big bat. He's hunting. But the one who lives in you as your Lord and Savior is greater, far greater than that evil, wicked one. We can't defeat him. Christ already did. Let's lean hard. Claim this life that God has offered us. Gracious Lord and God, we thank you. You sent us a Savior. By whose blood we are washed clean. Lord, completely transformed by your sacrifice on the cross. From that moment of being washed clean, Satan goes on full attack to draw us back in, to get us to deny, to get us to turn away, to get us to forget, to get us to doubt. Lord, you, you died on the cross and you rose and you're seated on that holy throne and you promised us you wouldn't leave us abandoned. You wouldn't leave us alone. You told us that. You made that promise. And as you went, you sent the Holy Spirit to live in us, to be our guardian, our guide, our strength, to be our early warning system. To be that one that, that when we foolishly do step over the line, convicts us and calls us to repent and turn back and go in the other direction and then reminds us that we are saved by grace, that we are a people of life so that Satan can't come in and distort and say, oh, you horrible person, look what you did. God, God will probably abandon you now. No, Lord, we have your Holy Spirit living in us that testifies that we are yours and that nothing can separate us from your love, nothing can steal us from your grace, not even Satan himself. Lord, thank you that you sent the Spirit to be our anchoring, to be our strength, to be our power, to be our reminder, to testify to us every day that we were created to be connected to you and you alone as our life source. Thank you, Lord.
Almighty God, we give you all praise and honor and glory. The mighty gift of the Father, the sacrifice of the Son, the continuing work of the Holy Spirit. All for us. Thank you. Amen. Christ Jesus crucified Salvation through repentance At the cross on which he died Now hear my absolution Forgiveness for my sin I sink beneath the waters that Christ was buried in. I will rise, I will rise, as Christ was raised to life, now in Him, now in baptized in blood and fire no fear of condemnation by faith I'm justified I will rise I will rise as Christ was raised to life now in Him, now in Him, I live. I will rise, I will rise, as Christ was raised to life. Now in Him, now in Him. Confess your Lordship and glorify your name. Your word, it stands eternal. Your kingdom knows no end. Your praise goes on forever and on and on again. No power can stand against you. No curse assaults your throne. No one can steal your glory. For it is yours alone, I stand to sing your praises, I stand to testify, for I was dead in my sin, but now I rise, I will rise, as Christ was raised to life, now in Him, now in Him. No curse assault your throne, no one can steal your glory, for it is yours alone. I stand to sing your praises, I stand to testify, for I was dead in my sin. But now I rise, I will rise, as Christ was raised to life. Now in Him, now in Him, I live. I will rise, I will rise, 
as Christ was raised to life. Now in Him, now 